Welcome to AutoLine this week, where we're going to be discussing all the intricacies of how GM was going through and coming out of bankruptcy. And that's because my special guest today is Ed Whitaker, the former chairman and CEO of General Motors, who's just finished writing this book, American Turnaround. And Ed, welcome to AutoLine. Thank Great you. to have you nice here. Nice to be here. Also joining me, I have to uh, say I'm chagrined to admit, are two other authors. I'm the only non-author at the <laughs> table today. Joe White, Pulitzer Prize winner for your book, Comeback, that you had. For the covers that led to it, but close enough. Uh, okay. And uh, Bill Vlasic, who also has uh, just finished a book in uh, the last year or so called Once Upon a Car. So great having the both of you here on the show as well. Thanks, John. Ed, in your book, uh, I, I, you know, anybody in the industry is going to want to watch, uh, read this, because you, you get into some of the personalities that you found at GM at senior levels of management that you didn't think were getting the job done. But here's my question to you. You don't really say a whole lot about the board of directors at GM. We saw 30 years of boards approving everything that helped drive GM into bankruptcy, finally. Anything that you care to share with us right now? I mean, what did you find on the board at GM in terms of capabilities when you got there? Well, I came in August and most of the directors had resigned or gone. The only old directors or holdover directors were really very new to the board. So I didn't get to know many of the previous directors and for whatever reason they had decided to leave. So we were in the business of appointing new directors uh, not old directors. They, most of those were gone. What do you think, though, of the process where these boards kept rubber stamping what management did over a three-decade period? And do you think General Motors now has a process for getting the right kind of people on the board? I think General Motors does have a right process now for getting uh, qualified, good, concerned, interested members on the board. I know they did when I were there. We took a, a great deal of effort to get the right kind of people there, people that were knowledgeable, people that would speak out, people that had certain experiences and backgrounds. So I think, you know, when I left, the process was good. I thought it was real good. Go ahead. Go ahead. And what surprised you the most when you first got at General Motors and you started looking at their management style and their structure and how the company had um, evolved to the point of going to bankruptcy and being bailed out by the government? Uh, the first thing that I heard when I got there, Bill, was we did nothing wrong. I asked people, senior managers, what happened here? What was the deal? Uh, almost to a person, I got the answer, we did, we did nothing wrong, the economy got us. Which then begs the question of, well, why didn't it get forward? Why didn't it get the other car companies? So I was amazed that there was no recognition that what had happened to this company. You know, they just ran out of cash. So there was no understanding of what had really happened. We did nothing wrong, the economy got us. You know, the thing, the thing, I've watched GM for a long time, and even now, I mean, certainly the, the good news is they've recovered, they're making money. Um, they have, uh, I like the term they call, and they have for it now, the fortress balance sheet. They've got almost $40 billion in cash. I mean, and that's all stuff that had not happened for years and years and years. But if you look at the fourth quarter numbers, uh, you know, Ford in North America earned $1.9 billion. GM in North America earned one4 And this is not a new contrast that Ford is smaller and yet they earn more money. And I just wonder whether when you were there or you know, when you look at it today, whether that isn't something that, that concerned you and concerns you still, that GM somehow doesn't seem to earn and produce the results that it should given its, its scale and the scope of its product line. You know, I haven't looked at those numbers, so I don't know sort of when you're gone, you're gone. But our concern at GM was making any money to start. And so to go from zero or losing to 1.4, you know, is nothing to sneeze at. I don't know your numbers. I don't know why I can't talk to that in any depth. But 1.4 billion is not a bad number. I can't answer the rest of your question. I don't know. And it wasn't something that you looked at at the time, the comparisons to We Ford. were trying to get on the positive side of profit, not negative side. I mean, we were making zero. We were losing. When you, and just to follow up on that, so let's go back to the time when you were there. Um, and, and you talk a lot in the book about the sort of the lack of clear accountability up and down the chain of command. 
as you started to dig into it, what were the prime reasons why GM fell on its face? And as you say, the other car companies, or some, most of the other car companies managed to pull through, um, you know, Ford being a particular example. I mean, was it legacy costs? Was it, was it waste in product development? What were the sort of the top items that kind of finally bubbled up as you dug into it? Well, I think there were several top items, but of course the main reason was the expenses were exceeding the revenues. And you start from there and you wonder why that's going on. But that's, that's pretty basic, right, in well, business? Well, right, right. So why was that going on? Well, that was going on because they weren't selling enough cars on the revenue side and the expenses were in runaway. I mean, it's just, just about that simple and the ex on the expense side, it was everywhere. It was I mean, everywhere. You, you, you can't pick out one particular thing to talk about. It, it was sort of everywhere. And one of the things that you talk about in trying to straighten out this mess is giving clear accountability within the company. Talk a little bit about that, would you? Because I think it's an important part in the book that your management style is to really strive for simplicity where everybody understands where they stand. Well, when you have a complex situation like we did, you, you somehow go back to the basics and I tried to do that and I would ask people, and these are good people, would say, uh, what do you do? They had a very difficult time in telling me what their job was. Who do you report to? Well, to this person and that person. I mean, it was, it was clear that nobody had an understanding of what this business was supposed to do. Uh, how it got that way, I don't know, that's for speculation. But it was very confused and complex, and right away you knew that we had to structure the reorganization, put in the right people, simplify things, and get it organized so there was some accountability and authority to go with that. Well, in the book you do point out one thing that led to all this, and this uh, is the matrix management uh, yes. structure that General Motors used. What is matrix management, and why does it not work in your book? Well, of course, I've had... Uh, this is just me, but I've been at AT&T a long time, 44 years. I'd experimented with different kinds of organizations. Matrix management was, was the big thing at one time. Uh, we tried a little bit of that, didn't work at all. Explain that for people who don't know what that means, matrix management. Matrix management really means that you have more than one boss, that you're accountable to more than one person for your actions. And it's a very confusing way to operate. You might report to one person for one function, another person to another function, and even a third person might rate your performance. And so you're never really sure who you report to or why or the purpose. And GM had that in spades. It was a pretty dramatic moment in GM history when you uh, and the board relieved Fritz Henderson, the CEO uh, of his duties, and took over yourself to be CEO. And it was a, you detail this in the book, but you look back on that and it was a, a moment of truth and you stepped up uh, to become CEO. How did the, um, the organization receive you initially after uh, not only Fritz Henderson being let go, but on the heels of Rick Wagner, who had been CEO for several years, being let go? Well, they're both good guys and I can't speak to the past, but... When I came to GM in August of that year, uh, the board decided that we had to see some turn turnaround or change in a relatively short period of time. In this case, it was about 90 days. And we kept uh, watching for changes, basic changes in the organization, and we didn't see any. So the decision was made about 90 days later that we needed another CEO. We were under TARP at the time, and you know what that does uh, for compensation and, and outside hires, et cetera. So weren't many ways we could look outside. So the board sort of looked at me and said, Ed, will you do it? And old Ed said, yes, I'll do it, because I was there and I had been spending some time. But the people at GM uh, accepted me warmly. I had a great experience. Uh, I didn't know anything about cars, obviously, very little. But uh, the people at GM welcomed me. The people at GM were embarrassed about what had happened. In some cases, they told me their neighbors wouldn't speak to them. You know, they felt shunned. And uh, 
They wanted to prove that they could do the job. They wanted that very much. Look, we want to show you where the we can be the best. So with that background, you know, I was accepted and away we went. You decided, and again, this is in the book, but I want you to talk about it here a little bit. Um, you, obviously, you decided uh, bef before the IPO uh, to step down. Um, and I wonder if um, you've had any, I don't know, regrets is the word, or, or if you've thought back on that as to whether maybe it would have been better for the organization if, if you had stayed and provided that continuity. I'm just curious, sort of, of as you I look at the company now. I had terrible feelings about leaving, and I'll tell you how that happened. When I first got there, the best estimate of an IPO was like two years away, and I was uh, going to stay through the IPO. But some interesting things happened along the way. We started making money a lot faster than people thought. And so the IPO, rather than two years away, was more like a year away. And and I was in favor of that. I think the sooner we could shed the label government motors, the better, or do anything to, to take that adjective away. So we went to an IPO a year earlier than people thought. I thought that the person running GM needed a longer runway than I had. I was 69 years old at the time. I had terrible regrets about stepping down. I had a lot of uh, misfeelings about that, and I wanted to stay. On the other hand, the IPO came quicker. The person that was going to stay there needed runway. And so I thought, better me leave than stay. Uh, that was a very tough decision. Sure, I have regrets. Still think about it. And you were an advocate early on for 100% um, uh, getting the government out of GM as quickly as possible. That didn't happen. I always thought the IPO seemed very successful except for one respect the government still had this huge ownership stake, which it still has, and the government motors uh, stigma kind of lingers. Kind of lingers. Um, it, was that uh, uh, just a function of Wall Street pressing the company to, to do the IPO quickly and your advisors and maybe the bigger picture was missed that if you could do it in one fell swoop, it would have been preferable and probably more positive? I advocated as strongly as I could to get out day one government to sell its own stake. But in the final analysis, that was a Treasury Department decision, not mine. Who, how high up the chain were you allowed to personally make that case? I mean, Well, I Tim made, Geithner, I made that president? case as, as strongly as I could. I made that case uh, as high as you can go in Treasury. But somebody made the decision in the government not to sell the entire stake. You'll have to ask them why. I never did know. You say something in the book that, that I did not know, maybe Bill, you did, that, that, that if, if given the demand on that day, that they could have probably gotten out the government with, with full repayment. Well, I guess 83 we'll, billion, I think is the figure, right? I, I guess we'll never know, but it was oversubscribed and it was a bigger number than, than we have today. I mean, right now, the stock, as I understand it, is trading roughly f f half, maybe a little more than half of the value that the government says is, is, is break even. Uh, that a surprise to you? I mean, the, the, it's trading so low relative to that? Well, I think it went uh, an IPO, $33 or something, and it was way oversubscribed, so I don't think anybody could know how much uh, could have raised on that particular day today. It's pretty close to that number. I think it's in the high 20s, the high but it's 20s. one of those questions we'll never know because the decision was made not to sell it. And there's another version that made its round in this town as to why you left GM, that in fact, so the story goes, mm -hmm. there was a faction on the board that was pushing for a change, and that uh, uh, the board, uh, according to this story, had not been consulted, I think, when you did the AmeriCredit uh, deal, and that that started this faction really pushing to, to get you out of there and get somebody else in there. Well, that's not true. The AmeriCredit deal was done because uh, we couldn't finance in the subprime credit arena. And I, we started to look and we found out that people were more likely to make their car payment than their house payment. On the theory, I guess you could live in your car, but you couldn't drive your house. <laughs> you know, something, something like that. And we found out that uh, some of the other makers were making 20% of their sales in this area. And we were completely missing on that. It was a pretty easy decision to buy AmeriCredit. We had the board's backing on that. We did keep them informed, and that's worked out uh, tremendously for GE. 
worked out great. They're making a lot of money because of that. Ed, one of the big decisions the board made early on was to keep um, Opal, the GM European business. And here we are a few years later, and Opal is still restructuring, still trying to make money. And uh, it sounds like the old GM a little bit uh, will do it by the middle of the decade. Um, uh, any ideas on what might accelerate uh, GM's sort of European uh, transformation? Because it seems to be the one thing that's not, not just holding GM back, but other companies as well. Right. But str strategically, and as far as the, uh, um, the structure is concerned, I don't know if, uh, if it's any different than it was three or four years ago. Well, I guess there's a lot of uh, speculation about that, and as you pointed out, it's holding back other car companies too, but I thought, the board thought, it was a management problem. Uh, from where I sit today, and I don't have intimate knowledge, I think it's a management problem. I think every problem is a management problem. I think that can be fixed. They are two great names. Uh, length of time, I can't tell you. I don't have any insights into what's going on at this point in time other than what I read in the paper. But I think GM was correct in keeping Opal, and I think it can be fixed, and I think it's a management problem. You talk a lot about um, <clears throat> management and the importance of people in your book. That's a big theme in the book. And I want to try to get you to talk a little bit about this specifically, and you alluded to it earlier here. The, um, the issue with recruiting senior executives from outside or from anywhere else, either outside the car industry or outside um, of GM, uh, because of the restrictions on TARP. How, how big an obstacle was that really? Was that something that you, that you worried about when you were on the board, the ability to, to go get talented people to fill the gaps in the, in the incumbent management? No, it really, uh, it really wasn't a problem while I was here. Could be a problem long term. I hold the basic belief that you should promote <coughs> from within. We did that at AT&T. I came here, it was a surprise. Everybody had worked everywhere else. It was sort of a revolving door up here. Well, that, that means a lot of things to me, but I often thought and still think you should promote from within. And GM's got a lot of potential people who can do go much higher in the business and be responsible. Well, you, sp you cite a specific here, Mark Royce, in the, in the book. You, you speak highly of Mark, and obviously he's running North America now for GM. Um, when, you basically have the same view that he could be the CEO, or has that changed as you've looked at the, 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 the number of people sort of in the horse race that's been set up there now? Well, if you look inside the company, uh, I think you'd have to say Mark is a candidate. I don't know what the current management is thinking, but if you like internal people like I do, and they're familiar with your business and they know what needs to be done and what needs to be corrected and directions that, that need to be changed, uh, yeah, I think he is and I think there are others inside. Absolutely. I, I was amazed that everybody in senior management seemed to have worked somewhere else or two other places. Some of them had been around twice. Well, I came from an industry where that almost never happened. That didn't used to happen here. That was a relatively recent development, the sort of the revolving. I don't know. I, you know, it was not understandable of, to me. With the exception of Bob Lutz, pretty much everybody at the, the senior levels at GM, they, they were careerists. I mean, they'd been there they're right out of college. Well, I wasn't speaking only of se uh, senior managers, and I think you're probably correct, although I'm not sure, but below and below, another level below, they'd been around. It was amazing to me. So talk a little bit about that, of promoting from within. We've seen several moves lately where GM uh, has promoted within, within, but brought people from really the outside and have given them assignments which their, none of their career has prepared them for. Talk a little bit about what's the value of putting in somebody who's fresh blood, so to speak, and somebody who gets in there who really has never done that job before. Well... I think there are pluses and minuses to both, and I think we'd all understand what those are. Ask me that question again in a different way. Let me let, put it this way. Uh, Bob Ferguson is now the head of Cadillac. No experience in the automotive business whatsoever. Well, he'd been in Washington. He'd been lobbying for GM. He, he understood a little bit. Uh, I, I, has he ever done any amount of retail in his career? I mean, th th this is what astonishes me of... He had a big, big, big marketing job at AT&T. Is it the same selling phone services as selling cars? 
there's more similarities than you'd think, mm -hmm. absolutely. Could you elaborate on that? Because I'd like to hear some of your th thinking about marketing, which I still think is one of the GM's trouble points yet, connecting with people. I mean, talk about that from the point well, of view of marketing and what you th see there. Marketing involves more than selling. It's, you know, figuring out a strategy on how to carry your name and your products forward, how you execute that. Uh, Bob did a great job at AT&T on, on that item, uh, marketing. He was very successful. We were marketing products at AT&T. He's marketing products here. It's not like he's a total uh, beginner at this. He's been around this a long time. He gets it. He understands what to do. He's well, very good I, with customers. I'll tell you what a, a BMW vice president told me, that at BMW that would never happen that you would never put somebody in charge of that brand globally who hadn't spent time in Europe, in Latin America, Asia, who had pre clearly shown that they were better than anybody else in the organization to get that position. And, and they think that Cadillac has no chance with somebody uh, like that in charge. Well, I would guess they would be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And you, you're always very candid that you're not a car guy and right. you came to Detroit um, you know, without any preconceptions, yet you're the only CEO that I have ever known in Detroit who actually went into the factory in a sweatshirt and jeans and worked on the assembly line for part of a day. And I know it was a, you know, just a, an experience, but what did you learn doing that? And I'm, I'm kind of curious, why don't more CEOs actually take a day or some time to be hands-on with the actual product? that they're making. I can't, I can't answer that, Bill. I can only tell you how I feel about that. And that is people are the most important asset of any business. And I'm talking about people from the assembly line to the top. And how else do you get to know how people feel about a business if you don't go visit, if you don't talk to them and see what they think? And I found the assembly line workers to be terrific, very concerned about GM. What are we going to do? We want to be the best. Uh, I thought they were terrific people, and I asked a lot of questions. I got to know the workforce out there as best I could in, in the time I was here. And they're the reason the quality of GM came up so quickly. They're the reason, in my judgment, that GM's doing better. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, there always was a stereotype about auto workers that I always felt was unfair uh, for all of them, yet you also come to Detroit at a time when all these emotions and feelings about right. General Motors are really off the charts from one extreme to the other, especially in Washington. How did that, uh, what kind of education was that for you about how people actually felt in America about this, this company that uh, really defined Detroit and the auto industry for 50 years? Well, that was all over the map, too, Bill. Uh, some people had great feelings. Some called it government motors. Some said they'd never buy another vehicle. Uh, the employees were devastated. A lot of them were. Like I said, there was this pent-up emotion of, we can do better. We want to show that we're going to do better. It was all over the map. It was, uh, it was an interesting, strange time. And in Washington, the extremes of the opinions about General Motors, as we all saw during the hearings, very intense. I mean, uh, very. Um, you tried to calm the waters there a little bit, didn't you? Spent a lot of time uh, in Washington, got some really good people to go to Washington, uh, people that were knowledgeable about that. Never did calm it totally down, but I think we, we got it to a level that was, uh, was okay. What, and, what do you think policymakers or, you know, investors or consumers should take away from this whole experience that 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 you that you've had and that GM has had. I mean what you know 10 years from now or 20 years from now what what should we what do you think we're going to learn from what happened here this really unusual intervention in such a huge company bringing in people from outside as 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 leaders um, all of this. I mean what, what you know the, what do you think the takeaway is going to be with with some distance of time have you been able to put that together in your head? Yeah, I've put that together and taken it apart and put it back together several times. Oh, no, t tell us. I think uh, one thing would be optimism. I think uh, with the right leadership and the, and the right people, which I thought we had, that no situation is hopeless. I think it was absolutely the right thing to do for the government, which is really you and I, the taxpayer, to bail out GM. 
I think they went through a difficult time for a lot of reasons, uh, most of which could be, could have been permit, uh, uh, you know, prevented. Most of which could have been prevented. But I think there's a reason for optimism. I think you have to say the American worker is alive, well, optimistic, and can do anything, given the right. Uh, conditions around that. That includes good management. That includes uh, taking care of employees, having clear goals like ours at GM was to design, build, and sell the world's best vehicles. Nobody at GM knew what we were supposed to do. I asked that question early on. I said, what do we do at this company? I mean, that was like day one, and I couldn't get a clear answer. You know, there, it was all over the map. And Tom Stevens came up and said, well, we're supposed to, we were in a, in a meeting. Everybody was sitting there. And we must have beat this around for 30 or 40 minutes. And Tom Stevens finally said, we're supposed to design, build, and sell the world's best vehicles. That struck a note with me. I think the other senior managers, we communicated that to everybody in the company assembly line on. I think from that point on, it was a big turning point. And with that point, Good to end up this discussion. Ed Whitaker, thanks so much for coming on the My show. Pleasure. Check out his book, American Turnaround, Great Lessons for Everybody in the Auto Industry and Beyond. And I want to thank my friends Joe White and Bill Flasick as well. And hope you'll all join us here next week for Autoline This Week.